What? 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 And you live. You live, you live, you live. All right, perfect. All right. Today is uh, action-packed, as always. Everybody knows I uh, like having women in studio that can beat me up. I'm into that kind of I was of afraid shit. of what you were going to say there, man. I'm glad you cleared that up at the end. I know. Me too. But we, ha- we have another, I-, I-, I believe the proper term is Aussie in studio. Is that the proper term? Can I say that? Aussie? With a Z. With a Z? Yeah. All right. Aussie. Aussie. We have another Aussie. I want to get it right. Like it's Aussie. Aussie. We have another, like Aussie. All right. We have another Aussie in the studio. So I'm really um, pumped up to hear her story. We became friends through mutual friends and actually coincidentally train in the same place, but never really train together because I'm afraid. She's, she's a super badass chick, probably one of the most badass chicks hands down in our gym. And I'm so pumped to have her. We have the one and only Miss Jessie Jess. So she's so much fun. She's actually super energetic to be around. She's a little banged up today. She's not 100, but we're going to try to pull 100 out of her. I had a lot of coffee this morning, so I think I'm all right. Oh, (laughs) she's flying. So tell everybody that doesn't know, why don't you get into it a little bit, give everybody your backstory and how the hell you ended up here because you're a defector from Australia. <laughs> a defector. I'm here legally, just <laughs> FYI, for everyone who cares. I'm legal. Uh, Damn, I was going to marry you for your green card. <laughs> Damn. Damn, my shot is gone. So, well, and I've been trying for that one for three years I now. Love it hasn't worked yet. One strike. Stop bringing these Australians <laughs> in here, John. I know. Uh, how did I end up here? Yeah. Uh, funny story. That's not so funny. But my ex fiance actually tried to kill me in my apartment. In Sydney, Alrighty and then. I had to have him arrested, and my manager freaked out and was like, "You're gonna go back to him if you stay there." So he bought me a one-way ticket, and then I just never went home. Did that well, just a put a damper? Uh, <laughs> in, today, uh, in, in today's in, news, in no. Today's you, you news. Have, on a lighter note. Wait, you have to you have to give us a little bit, oh, a, a little bit more, because I've had a lot of crazy stories in here. We've heard it all here. We've heard about aliens. We've heard about landing on other planets. We've heard about abductions. We haven't been I've asking about abducted. the DMs lately, though. John. Yeah, we haven't we been asking about the DMs. We will get to that with her. But we, <laughs> but you, there was an attempt on your life that led to you fleeing. Did you leave everything behind? Uh, I didn't really have anything. All I had was my cat. So after it happened and I had him arrested, my cat and I went and lived in a supplement store for three days until I could get together enough money to send him to live with my mom. A and then supplement I came, store. Yeah, and then I came to America. Is that how? Is that how you got so in shape? Yeah, was running away from ex boyfriends and living in a living supplement, in yeah. the supplement store. <laughs> yeah. So you get to a supplement store, your bags are packed. This is traumatic. We're laughing and joking, but this is it's like been you, three years. Yeah. Like I, so you can you I've can look back faster, on it yeah. with a little love, not love for him, but love for like the struggle. <clears throat> so, at that time though, when you're living in the supplement store, you're like, my life's ruined. I'm done because uh, you're on top of the world now, but. Yeah, well, like, yes and no. Because obviously, if it, if the relationship got to that stage, there'd be a lot of negative leading up to it. So that was kind of like the volcanic explosion, mm. you know? So it was, a, it was a lot of relief, but then also, like, panic. Like, what the fuck do I do? Am I allowed to cuss? Yeah, I'm assuming yes. Yeah, it's but, <laughs> um, of course. But, like, what the fuck do I do? I was more worried about getting my cat up to live with my mom. That was that was kind of the bit the most traumatic part of, of that experience was my cat having to live in a supplement store. So you save Mr. Kitty. Yes. Okay. And you're living in a supplement you're living in a van down by the river. You're living <laughs> in a supplement store. And then you're like, I'm gonna get this one way ticket and was it the dream to do the UFC stuff? Did that just kinda come about or were you just kinda like, you know what, I'm gonna get on this plane and who knows what's gonna happen? Well, I always knew, like, the year before I'd fought here in Vegas at the Cosmopolitan. Okay, so there was an established... Yeah, yeah, so I already knew that I kind of needed to come out here, but it was like, I was stuck. And then, so when that happened, my manager saw it as an opportunity and was like, cool, now you can leave, like, you have to leave, let's go. So he just bought me a ticket and I came out, I had like 200 bucks to my name, came to Vegas, legally not allowed to work here, and just kind of figured it out, found some random, like, found family of a friend of a friend out in Summerlin to go stay with. And I went and stayed with them and then walked to Syndicate every day. So you had $193 more than The Rock in your pocket. Yeah. When you were getting yeah, started. Yeah, so technically I was more successful than The Rock. So. Mm-hmm. 
That's amazing. That's a great story, though. <laughs> it really is. Um, I do want to. Someone commented down below. Yes, we were all we're all pretty sick and banged up. I appreciate the well wishes. We're all on cold medicine. I want to thank everyone in the Cave Our Studio, and of course, uh, Jesse Jess for stopping in. Um, but yeah, we're a little banged up, so excuse the raspiness on everybody's <coughs> part, and of course the 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 catching up the the <coughs> the coffee. Yeah, love that. So sleep. we're all doing <coughs> it. It's okay, but. Uh, that's amazing. So, so you go through this transition. You get here. You're walking a syndicate. You're getting your legs underneath you, so to speak, in more ways than one. Um, at what point are you like? Do you feel like it's coming together and like life is normal? Uh, to be honest, like I've been here three years. It's probably only been the. Oh, actually, I can't say anything's really come together yet. <laughs> like a lot of these really great opportunities have happened, but then they've been like stamped with negativity. But um, you, I, like, I feel pretty, I feel pretty set now. But you like living in the struggle. Some people like. I do. They do. Some yeah. people do like that. Like I like that. I don't mind it. I always need a challenge. Like I need yeah. like, is my, it can all go right, but I need like the sky to fall. Yeah. Too. I definitely get very bored very quickly. I okay. think that that's why like. That's how I knew I wanted to fight because it was the only thing I ever stuck to for longer than three months. So really. talk talk to me about the fighting. Why fighting? Because it's fun. Because I legally and uh, I legally get to hurt people as much as I want, and people want me to do it, and they pay me to do it. You know, I'm super competitive. I love it. I love it. I played team sports for a long time when I was growing up, and this they don't compare to what I get to do now. Uh. I don't know. What? <laughs> do you feel like you, like, it's, does it empower women? Because you know in the beginning, like, when Ronda got beat up, everybody was like, oh, my God, I don't want to see women get beat up. Like, do you feel like the UFC's crossed over now and it's, like, a truly accepted thing for women to do to get in a cage and beat the hell out of each other? Is it, or are you guys still knocking down some of those walls? Because I love it and I like watching it, but I still see some people that kind of cringe and do, do you deal with any of that, any of that backlash? Yeah, definitely. I think it's going to be a long time before it's 100% accepted. I, I, to be honest, I don't think it's ever going to be 100% accepted because there's always, like, there's the, there's the fraction of the po population that's like, oh, we don't think that women should be doing men's sports. There's right. a fraction that goes, oh, we don't want to see women be violent or we don't want to see women mm. get hurt. There's a fraction who go, fuck yeah, hot chicks in bikini, like, almost in bikinis. Mm -hmm wrestling each other so then it's completely sexualized and then there's a fraction that's like yeah women deserve to compete you know so i don't know that you'll ever really combat all those other areas i don't think it you know that's funny you bring up the sexualized thing i don't think it's sexualized at all like i don't look at any of them and i'm friends with quite a few um women fighters i don't watch a lot of fighting you know i don't watch a ton of ufc neither do i i, I really don't <laughs> it's a funny thing like i'll watch it sometimes with ag and he'll be like hey did you see that and i'm like i it's Chinese to me. Mm. Uh, I like jujitsu because it's like yoga, but there's different <laughs> reasons for that. Um, you know, it, it's, I love it. And I think the UFC has done a phenomenal job. I think Ronda was a catalyst. I think it's now got legitimate divisions, legitimate fighters. You know, I'm, I'm friendly with Kat Zingano and, and some folks, and I think they've all done a great job establishing what it is now and getting it to this point. But there was a lot of growing pains. And now I see female fighters um being looked at as fighters like i don't look at i don't I, at least i don't cue you do, do you look at them and you sexual i don't i don't see that when they when they're in the cage maybe if like ronda did a photo shoot yeah something like that but i'm scared to death now maybe it's because i dated a black belt at one point and got beat up <laughs> i don't i don't look at them and i'm not like hey geez they're almost in bikinis uh that's what the ring girls are for the ring card people i think that's that's what that's for but i think the sport's done a good job dispelling some of that you know what i mean and making it like you guys are looked at as badasses and the divisions kind of stacked now yeah you know yeah. there's um, definitely more women involved and i think the people i find that the men that are involved in the sport in some form they're the ones that treat us with a lot of respect it's the ones that have that just see us that are just spectators that still seem to sexualize a lot of it you know did you get into it for self-defense uh, first? No, I got into kickboxing to cut weight for a powerlifting meet. And then I just never powerlifted again. Yeah, I don't like... I'm, I powerlifted for years, mm -hmm. and I'm not... Um, I'm old. Let me let me put it this way. Like, like Tony and I have had this fight. I'm not a big fan, as I've gotten older, of <laughs> deadlifts and certain things. And there's yeah. a reason for this. And a lot of guys have come out and said, just deadlifting for deadlift's sake is not 
healthy. It's not yeah. good. And there's reasons for that. Like I, I've gotten away from it as I've gotten older because I feel like that much stress on the joints and on my body isn't good. Yeah. But that's me. Now, you get away from it and you get into the kickboxing and you get into everything else. Did you ever like talk to family and they were like, you're fucking crazy? Or were they like supportive? Uh, my family's always been super supportive. I think my mom uh, was more disappointed that I didn't go get a real job. Oh God. At the start, because I'd already, I'd always told her, well, like I went to university or college uh, for like three months. She was super stoked when I went to college. And then I was like, actually, I think I want to fight full time. I'm going to quit. And then I think she was a little bummed out about that. But once she realized that I was actually sticking to this and she's been super supportive, like she, her and my granddad travel to near every fight that I have. Like they've been to Korea, they've been to Singapore, they've been to the States, they're coming to Russia. Like they just follow me everywhere. But let me ask you a question. What's a real job? Oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't know. Like today. I mean, I definitely don't feel like I have a real job. I, I get paid to do a hobby. Like I, I think a real job is sitting nine to five behind a computer. But I think our generation's redefining that. Yeah. Like I don't know anybody in this building that has a like, on, at least on our side that has a real job. Like Marcy, do you feel like you have a real job? Yeah. Uh, Q. Yeah. <laughs> I sell crack. Crack. <laughs> because like I just don't feel like. I feel like that there's a huge <laughs> paradigm shift. Like, I think our parents' generation yeah. lived like that. And maybe, like, a real job to them is, like, maybe going and selling cars or, like... Yeah. Being she wanted a, me to be a lawyer. Be a lawyer, yeah. be an accountant, like, something like that. But what they don't realize is even being a lawyer or an accountant, you still got to go get the clients. Yeah. So why wouldn't you just do what you love and then build up the fans or the ticket sales or the followers? Yeah. And it's the same thing. I don't know. I just don't think the context is the same anymore and it's just that whole generation needs to like kind of see it yeah for what it well is. to me like my mom my mom was a single parent you know so she when she had me she stopped working full-time she's only just started working again now so i don't understand how she could ever go oh you need to have a real job when she never had a real job whoa but maybe but maybe that's why she raising wanted you me is to. a real job <laughs> how dare you but you know what i mean i know you, you know mean. what i mean but i think i think that's why like because she kind of got, like, she loves being a mom, obviously. Because she had six children. But she kind of got stuck in this cycle where she had to commit all of her life. Six kids. Looking after us. <sighs> so I think she wanted something, she wanted me to, to be more established, you know, before I got into the having kids, getting married, all that bullshit. So how does it feel, though, being like this badass chick that could just choke a dude out? Because <laughs> you're, no, I mean, you're high energy. And, you know, I've watched you roll and grapple and, and, and it's, a, <laughs> it, it's funny you know I mean like how like do the belts mean anything to you or do you just want to win fights like what what's the motivator what's the driver which belts like like, like MMA belts jiu -jitsu, like jiu-jitsu belts and like what drive what in general like do you just like do it because you want to eat food or I mean like what's what? <sighs> some people like I just want to get money you know what I mean like what there's tons of different motivators like I love to compete I'm super competitive if you have any conversation with me I'm always going to try to compete at some point in that conversation mm. you know um, obviously I'm very high energy all the time and if I don't train like when I was injured so I was off for six months I was like a fucking nightmare it's a death sentence yeah I was a nightmare because I had so much energy mm. but I had nothing to Nothing that I can put it into, you know? So that's kind of, I think my mom says I had, a, my mom says I'm very aggressive. I don't think I'm aggressive. I think I'm just straightforward, but she says I'm aggressive and that's why I fight. But I just love to compete. Obviously I want money. I always knew I was going to be in entertainment. Like mm. I knew I would be the center of attention. I love being in the spotlight. I love everyone looking at me. You know, obviously I have face tattoos and stuff. Like I like, I like standing out from the crowd. Yeah, um, when you walked in here, you were on death's door. Now we put the, the cameras on and you're flying. <laughs> See? It's funny. It's I'm crazy. an entertainer. <laughs> it's good, though. No, I mean, that, like, listen, in, in, in Colby Covington's the same way. Yeah, I love Colby. Colby's dude. the same oh, way. Oh, don't tell anyone I said that. You know, <laughs> but I think everybody does secretly like his shtick because I, I, I that's another story for yeah. another time. I don't but, like his shtick. I like Colby as a person. I think he's opening doors with it. Yeah. And there's reasons behind it, and I get his reasons. Yeah, but. I understand. Yeah. But for you, where does it go from here now? What's the next step? Is it to win? Like, is bantamweight, or do you go down, or do you move? Like, what's what's the goal? Uh, I think I'll stay at bantamweight, you know. Although it's weird, my weight, my walk-around weight's a lot lower than it used to be when I first made the decision to go mm. to bantamweight. All of a sudden, 
I'm now walking around 10 pounds lighter. So I keep playing with the idea of going back to 125. But my coach tells me, you are not going to 125. So I'm okay with that. I'm just going to keep eating burgers and pizza and pasta every day. And I'm going to stay at Bantam weight. Um, obviously, UFC gold, for sure. 100%. I want to make money. I want that belt. I want to start getting paid more, you know. But I'll, I'll, I'll earn my right to get paid more. Now, do you feel the UFC does all it can for the athletes? Because I know that's been a bitter pill for Colby and for some of the guys I've had through here. Um, I know they're super good to you on the way in. Do you yeah. think, do you foresee um, changes coming for the athletes on the way out? Because I, I have a theory that at some point they're going to have to fix a lot of that and take care of you guys. Um, they're going to have to come up with some criteria. And I've talked to Matt Brown about this. I've talked yeah. to multiple uh -huh. fighters. This isn't like a, a singular conversation. Everybody sees it going in the same direction. Like Matt Brown was like, I left the UFC. I opened my gym. I didn't get a single phone call. Like I didn't get a retirement yeah. watch. I didn't get anything. And he's like, I'm a 30 fight guy. Yeah. Like no, and I said they're gonna have to put a wellness plan in at some point. Something when it's when it's done, I know that that's something that probably Forrest is fighting for. That's that's something yeah. that has to be done. I mean, do you foresee it getting to that point? Like as you transition and you figure out what you want to do, they should at least have a couple people that support you guys on the way out and and get you guys where you want to be after the sport because you have to start to think about that. Yeah, I think they should, and I think they will because. You're seeing now more of the athletes as they're coming to the end of their careers are starting to work for the actual company. Mm -hmm. And I believe they're the ones that will drive the change, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but to, I don't know. I, I think I haven't been in it long enough to really experience any, any of the negativity yet. And I've seen it go two ways. I like don't think it's the... negative. I think it's just dialogue, yeah. honestly, Jess. I think it's just more dialogue and Dana figuring out what supports you guys the best yeah. after the fact. And I think that's something Forrest is going to, and some of the team there are going to have to kind of dig through and figure out. I do think they're working mm -hmm. on it though, because like obviously with the PI being open, they're starting to realize that they need to take care of the athletes yeah, whilst just we're in our careers. And I think it'll, I think it'll transition over to retirement. Yeah. Conversation stimulates a lot of that. It's just, yeah. it's just having an open dialogue like, Hey, you know, I'm getting to the end and I'm thinking of opening my own gym. Do you have resources here that help me do that yeah. or help me transition to the next phase of my career? And I think a lot of, uh, I think that's something that makes the UFC unique because I think they have a lot of really cool creative people that could go on yeah, and continue do. to sell the sport. And I think that could be actually a badge of honor for them and not yeah. a negative. It can be something that they can be like, look, you know, here's all our guys and here's what they're doing now. And they just have to have somebody in place that they can call, something they can lean on. Um, you know, I don't, I know the PI is a huge, it's a step in that direction. Yeah. It really is. And, um, you know, I love what they're doing down there. I was fortunate to go by the contender series, you know, yeah. and, and check it out. And I think they have a lot of cool, that contender series is pretty badass. I have a beat. It's pretty cool. Yeah. You got to go by. Yeah. One day. Yeah, I'm one always day. working with it someday. Well, you're already there, so you don't need that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's, it is a kind of cool atmosphere yeah. that they've created. It's like a little bit of like a minor league thing. Do you think, talking about fighters after the fact, like, you know, we, we both go to the same gym, and I see this in a lot of gyms, and especially here in Vegas, because I came from SBG in Montana. There wasn't a lot of pro fighters. There's yeah. a couple. Um, do you feel like too many of them have this false hope that they're all going to make it to the UFC and make millions of dollars? Uh, I wouldn't say a false hope, because I feel like every, I feel like if you're getting into this sport and you're of a reasonable age, um, then that should be your goal, you know? I think there are some people that I see that are starting to fight really later in their years that maybe it's not a realistic goal, you know? Uh, Do you know. think every fighter should have a plan B? 100%. I have, like, 17 plan Bs. Okay. <laughs> like, 100%. And that, that's... That's my biggest argument. Like I coach fighters as well. Yeah. That's one of the things I'm always onto them about is that like, even if this is your primary career, like it's super short lived. You know, I'm 32 this year. I may fight for another four years, you know, at best. So obviously like what other career retires you in your mid thirties Oh, outside of athletics? And you're not rich at no. the end of it. By no stretch of the imagination, if you make it to the top of the card for a couple of fights or even a year or two, you know, then yeah, you can do well if you parlay it into certain Yeah, but certain that's things. if you're smart. Because like a lot of fighting tends to attract uh, like a lot of really broken individuals, you know. It's a 
it's just one of those sports where people get into it because they've been bullied, because they have low self-esteem, you know, for all these super negative reasons. So look, then, at a, look at American football. I mean, come on, talk about broken. Individual. Yeah, but they're also brought up through college and stuff and they have people looking after. We don't have anyone looking after us, you know. We don't, unless we go get financial, I'm talking about from, from a financial standpoint, sure. unless we oh, go yeah, get sure. financial advisors and accountants and stuff like that, like going from being broke and poor, like I was homeless for a long time, you know, or living in a car and then all of a sudden making $20,000. Like it's real easy to blow that money. I did my tax return for last year and I was like, where the fuck did all my money go? You know? Welcome to so my life. Yeah. But so unless like you could get to the top and make good money, but unless you have the common sense to actually invest it or do something with it, then that's not going to last very long. Yeah, because I sit around the mat and everybody I sit with is like, yeah, I'm going to go to the UFC and I'm going to be, I'm going to get rich and, and yeah, then I'm going to cool. open a gym. Tell me how like, to do that. <laughs> and I'm like, and I sit there and I, you know me, like I don't say much yeah. in the gym. Like yeah. once I'm, I walk in there, it's kind of <laughs> like, that's Casey's house. And well, I this keep, is the most I've ever heard you speak. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I'm like, it's Casey's house. So I kind of keep quiet when I'm in there, yeah. when I'm out of there, I'll, I'll run my mouth the minute I walk outside yeah. the door. But I, every cat I sit with, it's like, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm like, I applaud them for the focus. Yeah. Like the focus is awesome. But I'm like, have you thought about maybe a podcast? Yeah. Maybe this? Like, and they just look at you with a blank stare, like, no, I'm going to be world champion. I'm like, wow, this gym's got a lot of world yeah. champions. <laughs> like, holy cow. But that's awesome. You know, it's like, good it, and it's bad. It's awesome yes. to have those goals. But I feel like a lot of fighters aren't like they don't understand all the extra work they need to do outside of just training. Like we are in an entertainment sport. MMA is an entertainment sport. It's not just about athletics. You know, if you're in football, like your job is to go to training through the week, play on weekends, go back to training through the week, play on weekends. You know, like we mm. have to create our own fan bases. Like we have to, we have to be entertaining, entertaining enough. We have to go do podcasts. We have to go do interviews. We have to go do appearances to make sure that people know who we are. Because as soon as you're out, you're irrelevant because mm -hmm. you don't have a team backing you to keep you, to keep your name in the focus. So all the, like I find with a lot of fighters, they're like, yeah, like I'm just going to, I'm just going to train hard and I'm going to get there. I'm going to let my performance speak for itself. And I'm like, fuck no, dude. Like that's not like it's I not lost enough. my last fight and I still went up 60,000 on my Instagram followers, you know, mm -hmm. and I lost. But it, it comes from every other thing that I do outside of that. And all my sponsors and the people who pay my bills, they come not because I fight. They come because of everything else that I do outside of fighting. I'm glad you said that. Like that's the... Oh, I, got, that's I argue about this all the time. No, but that's, <laughs> that's the best I've heard it explained. It's you have to... Because people get bitter. Yeah. They get bitter that people have followings or they get bitter that this. They get bitter that, that that's going on. Whatever it is in their life. And they don't understand that there's... Fighting is one part of it. Yes, yeah. it's your supreme focus, just like this podcast. When I do this, I have to be on, regardless of whatever else is happening yeah. in my life. When I do other stuff in this building, I have to be on. So when I do the other things that help my business, whether it's sharing clips, posting stuff, putting things out there, that's all to water the grass. You yes. have to water the grass constantly, <laughs> and you have to do so many things. And you're constantly on the phone. You're constantly working your network, working your connections, yeah. keeping yourself relevant, pushing and growing. And you have to have like a controlled growth. Yeah. And you have to manage it as best you can before you kind of release it to the world, I like to say. Like before it starts to, you have to make that sure that that viral moment whenever it comes, whether it's fighting or whatever yeah. it is, that you're putting your best out there. And I think that, you know, regardless win or lose, it's how you carry yourself through every step exactly. of that. Exactly. You know, and I think that not enough people do mic work like this is getting yep. used to the mic and used to talking, getting used to taking photos, even in your best and worst conditions. The best advice I ever got was from a former Dallas Cowboy friend of mine. He said, John, he said, no matter what, you got to be a pro. Yeah. He said, you have to be a pro. He said, you, you have to kind of make stuff work. Like even today, you didn't, you didn't feel good. You didn't feel a hundred. You're like, I'm oh, fucking, I'll be there. Yeah. Like I'll make it work. And that's important because what happens with some of these guys is like you said, they get a supreme focus on one thing. Don't yeah. water the other things. Then they hate people like you because yeah. you're doing it. Yeah. And I've experienced some of that, even from my previous teammates that have been in the sport for a lot longer and have had a lot more fights to me and then I get opportunities before they do, you know, and I experience a lot of negativity. And they say it's just because you're a girl. Yeah. Well, no, this is coming from other girls and they're like, and like, I, I'm very uh, deliberate with how I promote myself. Like I very, like I'll post videos and stuff in shorts and a crop top while I'm striking or lifting, but I don't do bikini stuff. Like I don't do underwear stuff. I don't do, I don't overly sexualize my social media like some other people do, you know? So 
I like would get, I would get it through back at me like, oh, she's just getting opportunities because she's pretty. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm getting opportunities because I'm out working every week. Like I have four other jobs outside of fighting, you know, I look after a bunch of other athletes. Like I'm, I'm always giving back to the sport. I'm always putting attention into my social media. And this is like social media is so under, underutilized. And these particular, like they were old teammates of mine who, girls who were upset that I got signed before they got signed, you know, even though like whatever I'm, I'm working, like I'm busting my ass no, to preach, make sure, preach. to make sure that I'm entertaining in all areas, you know, right. that people want to see me fight. Even if they don't like me, like they still want to see me lose, you know, right. they want to see me win. They want to see me lose. That's whatever. the best. That's when you're hitting a home run. Yeah. When they want to watch you. Like I said this to somebody, like when, when we're getting into the podcast, we've had about 50 guests on. I said, you know, you want to get to a point like Howard Stern said he knew he made it when, when he got the, the the runs of his ratings and he said, what's the number one p- reason people watch? Because they want to see what he says next. What's the number one, pe- yeah. number, number one re- reason people hate him? It's because they want to see what he says yeah, next. Yeah. So like, no <laughs> matter what, they're tuning in, good and bad. Yeah. And that's kind of what you want. Like we, we talk about it here, Q&I, about like it's just checking a box. When somebody leaves a comment or somebody says something, like when somebody says, hey, fuck you, I hope you die, you're like, oh, yeah. cool, like that's you're awesome. Like, Have sick. a good I day. Keep watching, man. Yeah, yeah, keep watching. Like it's just getting that you know, that continued dialogue and yeah. just interaction yeah. is what it ends up being. Absolutely. It's just a check in a box. Yeah, and that's something I've said I've said to people who've, who've been negative about it in the past. Like, I've gone on and helped them create that through their social mm-hmm. media. Because like, social media is one of the most underutilized tools, you know? I think YouTube's the most underutilized tool. That's what I tell I everybody. I agree. I'm, trying to, I'm yeah. trying to be better at it. It's but. harder. It's where you separate the men from the boys. Yeah. Instagram's very easy. Yeah. And um, Instagram's one of those platforms that people, um, I guess, you know, it's the highlight of their day. It's that yeah. one moment of the day. And it's easy. Like anybody can sit here and be like, and be like this, like, oh, hi, you know, I got uh, Jesse Jess in studio, and oh my God, I'm so cool, <clears throat> and and they can be like, oh, boom, you know, <laughs> and I'm gonna put it on Instagram, and I'm gonna link it, and all that stuff. But yeah. YouTube takes work. No, YouTube, you've got to plan, edit, like film, you got to produce it. I know. That's why I'd be lazy with my YouTube because I have so many other jobs that I struggle to find the time to do YouTube. But I know that it's such a valuable marketing tool. So I want to talk to you about the division for a second. Let's go. Get into it. Tell me what you think about Bantamweight in general, uh, the overall, the women's division as a whole. Who do you like? Who do you hate? (laughs) And where do you think it's going? And how do you think it all shakes out? Uh, So with Bantamweight, it seems to be, it seems to be very black and white. Like there's, people at the top and then there's people at the bottom you know there's no there's no gray area in between like there's the there's the ones who've been fighting forever holly home raquel pennington amanda nunez like all those that are in the top five you know and then everyone else is pretty new so i kind of see i see a shift happening soon i think amanda will retire after one of the two more fights you know she's killing it seems pretty happy i know they talk about starting a family like she's got a farm in brazil or whatever so i think she's i think she's on her way out and then i kind of see holly maybe raquel some of those older not older but more experienced fighters hanging it up soon and then it's going to lead a new way a new wave to come through and i feel like i'm i'm ish part of the new wave because i haven't been in it for long but i also don't want to be fighting when i'm 40 take yourself out of it yeah give me your top three when the new wave comes in who you have your eye on that you're like they're doing good work uh, Irene Aldana, for sure. Irene Aldana. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't know. Julia Avila, Avila, I like. She's only had one fight so far, but that's pretty much it. Like, I'll be honest, I'm really bad at my job with actually paying attention to who's you just fighting focus and on, who's yeah. in it. Like, I focus on what I need to do and what's kind of coming next for me. And then after my next fight, then I go, all right, who's next on the list? Who do you look back on, like, the legacy folks, and you're like, damn, like, she was fucking awesome? Rhonda. Always. Always. Yeah. Like, love her or hate her, none of us would be here without her. I, I have a theory with her. I don't I don't think anybody, quote, unquote, hates her. I think people, like, whether it's, uh, you know, people have said in the past, like, she was very manufactured. But I've heard great explanations on it. That was what the division was. 
Yes. Like she was, <clears throat> yes, she was a superstar because of a number of factors. She had all the factors. But it's no different than any other sport. When baseball, they talk about five tool players. Can they run? Can they hit? Can they do yep. this? She could do a little bit of everything. She could be a cover person. She could be a model. She yeah. could be a personality that could talk. And along the way, she made a ton of enemies because she did all those things right. And she left a lot of people in the past because of it. But I think it was just her arc. Yeah. She was the first superstar in that woman's division in yeah. many ways. Um, since other people have came on, come along. But she was a judo expert who could land three or four moves from almost anywhere. Yeah. And she was very good at it. And she did the most with what she had. Yeah. Then when people started coming in with striking and other abilities, yes, yeah, she was. She got exposed along the way. Yeah. But that was... That was coming. That was that the was evolution. Supposed to happen, yeah, that you know? was supposed to happen. And then I remember when she lost, and people like on on her IG and everything else, people like shit all over. Her. And I'm like, this woman changed Damn, the whole yeah, game. Yeah, right. Like, and she went undefeated. Well, she went on a win streak for a long. time. It was like time. twelve fights yeah. or something. Yeah, it was obnoxious. And no one's done what she's done. Yeah, I mean, since. She, and that, that's why all the hate comes from people either being, uh, I guess, being disappointed. I don't even think it's hate. I think it's just being disappointed because they wanted to see her keep going or jealous. I think what it is, Jess, I think in the beginning when we're – and I look at 25 to 35 as young. Yeah. We're young. We're hustling. We're making stuff happen. <clears throat> we're willing to talk to everybody because we have the time and the bandwidth. And we're willing to, like, kind of give everybody a chance in our circle, so to speak. Yeah. And we're, we're just more available but as you reach a point of superstardom and the money starts coming in the fame, it's hard to let everybody come along for that yeah. ride. You can't take everybody yeah. with you. It's like your phone blows up when you go into a camp and you're getting ready for a yeah. fight because everybody wants to be a part of that. You know, everybody's trying to grab on to you. But you can't take everybody with you. Yeah. So along the way, it's like, oh, shit, she didn't get me tickets. Oh, shit, she don't love me. Oh, you know, she didn't take me. I wasn't at her camp and like, fuck that bitch, you know? Yeah. You, but you can't, what people don't realize is you can't let everybody, everybody can't come along on the ride. Yeah, also not everyone deserves to be a part of it. We're like, in a car. You can fit yeah. like four or five people. Yeah. Like that's like as good <clears throat> as it gets. Like you try, you do the best you can, but you're juggling flaming chainsaws at that yes. point. They're literally yes. flaming chainsaws. 100%. You know, like I'm sure when, when Monster comes along and CBD, MD, and all these different things, everybody like is like, oh, you know, she's the shit. They either want to be your friend or they start, well, to, they look at, hate they start to look at you a little <laughs> yeah. sideways like, uh. <coughs> What is she doing to yeah. get there? That's yeah. why when I go to, you know, you mentioned like, this is the most you heard me talk. When I go to training and everything, I just kind of keep, my, yeah. I do my thing. I sit in the corner. I just kind of keep quiet. But I have great relationships with people yeah. for that reason. Like yeah. I, I kind of do my thing, whatever, support me, hate me, do whatever you want. But I try to be as supportive to all you guys because I think you guys are the stars. I legitimately believe yep. that. I think you guys are the superstars, whether it was through the years, Tony or Hans or anybody or having folks in, uh, Matt, Colby. You know, I look at like like Ben when he came on the mat and he was moving out here. I was like, man, anything I can do, you know, yeah. yell out. You kind of say your thing, do your thing, and then you just keep to yourself and stay in your lane, you know. Yeah. But I think some people, you know, why do people hate? You Jealousy. Know? Is that the number one? I believe so, for sure. Because I know like... I know, like, to be honest, I don't get a whole lot of negativity. But anytime I do, it's because someone made a joke that I felt was inappropriate and I blocked them. So they make a new account and they get upset about it, you know. Or it's because I'm I'm dating someone, you know. Like, it's always jealousy. It's it's never... Support. No, like, I mean, I'm talking about specific negative comments. But mm. it's always it, it always comes from, a, from hurt or jealousy, you know. I just, I don't really think there's any other reason to hate someone. If you don't know them personally, what other reason could you have to hate them? Yeah, I feel like unless you have a personal story where you say, you know what, Jesse and I were cool, but she punched me in the face. <laughs> and I could be like, all right, all right I could, I I could that. see yeah. that. All right, that's a reason. But if to you're say, like, oh, I made a joke about alcoholism and she blocked me, what a fucking cunt. Mm. That's or, not, <laughs> that's no, not. or like, I always say this to people. I'm like, do you know her? Yeah. Like, have you spent time with her? I asked the same thing. Do you, you know, 
and I've heard Rob Rob Bailey says like he'll be like I'll be like oh so and so says hi they, they they mentioned they were a friend of yours and he'll be like who's my friend yeah like you know what I mean like I don't I'm very careful to throw the friend card around like I don't throw the friend card around He's unless acquaintance a lot or people yeah, I've I met know. them yeah. yeah I've spent some time with them yeah. I've broken bread with them you know I sit with them I eat with them you know um, but I wouldn't like say like they're my friend like yeah. Tony's my friend yeah like we're close. You know, certain people I'll say, we're close, we're friends, we text, we talk, you know, regularly. Um, like, I would say even after this, like, yeah, she's an acquaintance, cool chick, yeah. you know, I spent some time with her, awesome chick, you know. But we don't go hang out their mm. personal time, mm -mm. no. Yeah. You know, not to say you're against that, but you only have so much bandwidth and so much time. Yes. And that's that's part of the reason, this is what I want to get to, that's part of the reason why you can't give your number to everybody, you yes. can't, because people sometimes don't understand and how to manage the relationship. Yeah. Like, I have every guest that's walked through this building's number in my phone. Yeah. I'm friends, friendly with all of them, I'm friends with some of them, but I don't text them every day like, yo, dog, what you up to? Yeah, like, yeah. It's just not that way, yeah. unless I had to or had a reason to. Because I understand the fragility yeah. of the relationship. And I'm like, if I have an opportunity, because I know where it's at. You will do something if the, it has to be a benefit on both sides. Exactly. Like, hey, I'm going to go eat. Jeez, I'm hungry too. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. That's the basic level. At a higher level, as you get busy and you have a lot going on, it has to be both sides yeah. win. Yeah. And okay. that's why I get a lot of people get upset with me because that's I'm, what I was getting I'm at. bad at texting people back because... Like I said, I have four other jobs outside of training. So literally, I, I teach my first class. I'm either training at 6 a.m. or I'm teaching at 7 a.m., you know? So from that time in the morning until 10 o'clock at night when I get home, I'm usually busy. So if I'm texting someone, it's because I need something from them immediately or it's to do with work. So I have, like, I have people I'm friendly with who text me about random stuff and I don't get back to them for a while. I don't even get back to some work people for a while if I don't feel like it warrants an immediate response, you know, but, and I, and I say to them, like, I just, I forgot to reply. Like I read it while I was training. I read it while I was working and I, and I forgot to do it afterwards, you know, but if it's important, I'll respond straight away. Like people text me to go, you know, go help them out with a photo shoot or something like that. And I go, I don't reply because I'm like, one, I know I can't do it anyway. And two, I forget. There's no right answer. No, sometimes. that's it. Like yeah. if I say no, you're going to be upset. If I don't reply, you're going to say you're going to be upset. But I'm not going to say yes because I know I don't have the time to go and do it. Yeah. And, and, and like I always try to make it win-win, like get some content, you know, like, hey, hang out, catch up. So yeah. you get a little of everything. Yeah. It's, it's win-win all around. It, do, you, do you see yourself making, because this is important in, in context of everything I do, do you see yourself making the women's self-defense thing later in life more important, or is that something that will come to the forefront? Because I know for my ex and for a lot of women in jiu-jitsu and fighting, they're big into women empowerment and women's self-defense. Is that something that you see growing as time goes on, as the, as the goals shift, and, and do you enjoy training women? I do. I love training women. Like I'm a coach. I'm always trying to inc include women and encourage women to come do my classes. I saw some of that last night. Yeah. Yeah. I love, like I love training with girls. I even though for me personally, for my career, it's good for me to train with other women. So I'm always trying to get girls to come in. Um, you know, my main students are female. Like I, I, I will always be the first one to try to welcome women into my gym. You know, I think self-defense is super important. I think even just the confidence at doing something like kickboxing or bag classes even gives you is very, is invaluable, you know? Right. So yeah, anything that I could ever do to try to increase awareness of that. But I think like, I know I could do a lot. I wish more female uh, combat sport athletes were wanting to give back to the sport in the same way. Cause I think that that's how we create a culture, but there's so many that are, kind of just focus on their own career, which you should be, you know, but beyond your own career, you should be giving back to the people who gave back to you. So I think that's that's the way we're going to get more fem more women involved in it is by having more women at the top opening doors for them. Because I, I know how intimidating it is, even for me, like when I first started going to Extreme Couture, like it, I've, been, I've been training for 10 years and fighting for eight, you know, and I still like was slightly intimidated walking into that gym. So I can't imagine what it's like being a female who has no experience, isn't in the sport, isn't in the industry and wants to learn how to defend themselves. So that's why I think it's really important to have high level women who have a platform to be the faces to go like, hey, like come here, I'm gonna create this avenue for you. I'm gonna help you get there. And then that's how we're gonna get more girls involved. Do you wanna own, more gym, own a gym yourself? Uh, I've thought about that. I think, honestly, I don't know if I want the responsibility that comes with owning a gym. 
if I could have someone else run it for me so I still had the freedom to travel, that would be great. I would much rather work and help at an established gym. Well, there's plenty of investors out there that like you could lend your name to it if it gets yeah. to that point and kind of come in and do as you please and... But I'm like, I'm, I'm a zero to a hundred, right? So if I'm going to do something, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it a hundred percent. And I think I would need to wait until I was a little further along mm. in my life to be able to commit to something like that because of all the other things that I do. So I love to coach and I love teaching and I love helping. Um, but the actual commitment of owning my own gym, I'm 100% not ready for that yet. How, how has it been, you know, seeing the current champions and past champions since you've been in the division do you learn from them what it takes to be a champion? Like what tidbits have you taken from them and, and what's your definition of being a champion in the UFC? That's a really good question. That's um, what we do here. We ask the difficult I, ones. I heard that before I came in today. Uh, you know, one, one thing I always say about, so obviously Amanda's the current champion in my division and one thing I've always said about her since she won the belt is that like – she conducts herself like a champion. She clearly thinks of her, believes in herself in that professional way. Um, her approach to training is, seems to be a lot more serious than maybe it used to be in the past. Because that's one thing I see with people getting signed to the UFC or signed to Bellator is that they seem to think, oh, I've made it so they can relax. You know, um, With Amanda, I believe she really stepped it up to maintain that. Um, yeah, I did, I, honestly, I think... I think I've seen a lot of disappointing champions just in that they don't understand how much reach they actually have and the platform that they have and they don't use it the right way. Obviously, my right way is going to be different to other people's right way. But I think if you're in that position where you're in like a powerful position, you should be using it for good. You know, you should be using it to help people. That's why, you know, Khabib donating his fight kit to Dustin Poirier's foundation was fucking, that was beautiful. You know, that was brilliant. I may not be... I don't know Khabib, so I can't say I'm a fan of him or not, you know, but that that really made me see him uh, as someone that I respect just because of that. And that's how I think a champion should behave. I like that. I can get with that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I can get with that, you know, it, and I think it, a lot is what's unseen. Yeah. You know, and, I, and when I say unseen, not highly publicized. Yeah. Something like him giving his fight kit to, to a, a charity or to a, to something that... People may view otherwise as a competitor of his, yeah. but having the graciousness. And I think a true coach, a true champion, always smiles in the face of stupidity yeah. and is gracious <laughs> at all times with his time. Yeah. I watched, um, I've seen in the past, okay, Jay Cutler be so gracious with his time. Yeah. And he'll sit and he'll listen to people. And they'll walk away. And I had this conversation with Michael Hernan here. And he'll say, you know, I'll be like, don't you get sick of it? And he's like, nah, bro, you can't. You just, you can't. Yeah. And I'm like, how do you listen to like someone come in and say, how do I get big? Yeah. Or how do I get strong? Or how do I become like, I love dissecting what makes someone successful. Yeah. And that's what I enjoy. And I like picking that apart and I never get sick of it because everybody has a different path and everybody has a different track. And a lot of it begins with what <coughs> people don't realize years and years and years of struggle. Yeah. And we're in a yeah. generation now, our generation, they want it all now. Yeah. Well, you see overnight successes. What's that? What's that? There's that one picture going around of, I think, Lionel Messi. And he's like, it took me 17 years to become an overnight success, which is exactly what it is, you know, like everyone saw Connor explode onto the scene. Everyone saw Rhonda explode onto the scene. Like they didn't see Rhonda being woken up by her mom in the middle of the night to go train when she was a kid. You mm -hmm. know, they don't look at any of that. Yeah. And they don't see like they, uh, especially <coughs> in my world, like people talk about Rogan, they don't see the years he did the UFC stuff for free. Yeah. The time, you know, he did nine years of his podcast before it was even anything. And if yeah. you go back and watch those old episodes, they're terrible. Yeah. You know, it's I remember listening to him back in like 2014 when I used to ride my bicycle to work before training every day. And I'd yeah. always listen to his podcast and on his, the way there. You know, it was all janky with a yeah. webcam and <laughs> yeah. none of it was like high end. Now you can do things in life to expedite the process yeah. faster by putting the right people around you early yeah. on, by having the right um, managers, the yeah. right infrastructure, and having you know the support in in a, you know that comes in different forms. Some people get good money support in the beginning. Some people don't. Some people get good media support. They catch something. Something goes viral. Yeah. Some people get too much too soon, 
And that's a bad thing, too. Ooh, we've seen that a lot. And yeah. we see that a lot. And it's just all about that juggle. And especially in the defense world, in the world I'm in, you have to be very careful. You have to be very, you know, you have to stay in your lane. And staying in your lane is really important. And you have to make sure that you understand your place and where you fit in all things. When I walk in, you know, yeah, I come from the gun world and the firearms world. It's very, I could walk in and, and you know, look at jujitsu as like, it's just another tool in the toolbox. But yeah. I know a lot of guys there take it very seriously to yeah. them. That's the ultimate. To me, it's not the ultimate. It's just another tool in the toolbox yeah. of self-defense. It fits in the spectrum, but it's just a slice. Yeah. And then there's yeah. guys that that's the whole pie. That's everything. Them. That's everything yeah. to them. And for me, it's just a slice. Um, but I think figuring out and dissecting what that success path is and how to get from A to B not enough people realize you have to go all the way to Z. Yeah. So there's a lot of steps. Yeah, it's not ju- it's not as easy it's as, not it as, looks easy as it looks. Yeah, you, you brought you brought up um, like Jay talking to fans and stuff like that. I actually learned the same thing. I did an appearance for Monster with Flex Lewis once. Oh. And so there was uh, there was Flex and I, and obviously like doing an appearance with Flex. 99.9% of the people who were there were there to see Flex. Like, no one even knew. And they don't I understand was. three words he says. No, <laughs> but watching him interact with everyone, like, I, lucky no one was there to see me, so I didn't have to do shit. So I just stood there watching him the whole time and watching, like, every second person. How do I grow my forearms like that? How do I make my calves bigger? And then watching him give, like, an honest, emotional answer to every single one of them to the point where the monster staff had to tell him to turn his answers down a little bit so that we could get through people. Oh, more. yeah, he's for, he takes forever. But, like, after that, I, I remember I asked him about it and I was like, do you, I'm like, do you speak to people like that all the time, you know, because I've done appearances with, with really big-name fighters where they're like, yep, cool, shake your hand, all right, fuck off, you know? Mm-hmm. And then watching him, who's more famous than almost anybody I know, you know, still take the time to give every single person an honest, genuine answer, I was like, all right, cool, like, that's how I need to be, you know? Yeah, Flex is, Flex is interesting. He's got it down. So, so I'll see him at events, and whenever I see him or Jay or anybody at events, I just give them a wave because I know yeah. they're working. Like, yeah. I'll be like, hey, what's up? It's like if I saw you at a UFC thing, I just be like, "What's up? You do you're working at but that." But he point. still takes the time. To he, say he'll take hello, the time. Yeah. But but you almost have to like just do that because you know that the other stuff's more important. Like I'm gonna yeah. be here, bro. Shoot me a message. Um, but he's got it down. He'll he'll shake your hand. He does the shoulder tap. Yeah. He does the head nod. He's got it all down cold, and it's almost like um, he's dialed in. And he, yeah. And he'll listen and receive everything you say, and he'll give you an answer. And like you said, it's almost too long winded. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. But he'll go into it, and he'll and it's not so much that he takes the time. It's I don't know how they hear the same questions yeah. over and over. That's the thing. And still give such and a passionate they still, answer. Yeah, they give a passionate answer. Like they'll be like, "Hey, bro, you know how do I, how do I grow my legs?" And you're just like, "Bro, you got asked that seventeen yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. How do you still give yeah. a good answer?" But then it's understanding that mm-hmm. that that that's the first time that person mm-hmm. has heard the answer. You yeah. Know? So you have to take the time and you have yeah. to be patient. And Mike O'Hearn, I asked him that when he was here. I said, "How do you, do you get sick of the people ever?" And he said, "No, I never get sick of the people." And I said, "How?" And he goes, "Same answer." He goes, "You just have to realize that that might be the first time yeah. that person's meeting you." And some guys have that rough exterior, but they're when you like like Matt Brown. Okay, so I was just with Matt. Matt has a super rough exterior, but when you get Matt going and you realize his humor, it's a little bit you know he has a little bit of that surly sarcastic yeah, humor yeah. it's like me like i got him going on thanksgiving and he's yeah. so passionate about how thanksgiving <laughs> needs to be he's like we need to be making brisket and we gotta make brisket great again and Damn. like i don't know why we're making turkeys <laughs> and he's gets so intense about it you remember that clip q it's like he gets super intense about it and you're just like i don't know if this guy's gonna knock me out <laughs> like because or, i don't want brisket but, for thanksgiving yeah, <laughs> but he's super chill about fuck it and he's, yeah he's like fuck the turkey you know but he's he's super cool and when you have dinner with him he's a different person yeah totally yeah. different person and you know and i get that like you have to have you can only be on so much like yeah. when i leave here and i go home and i'm done for the day i don't want to have as much dialogue yeah. with people like i'm yeah. kind of burnt out and i'm kind of like just you know just chill like 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 i was last night like last night like i'm just sitting and just yeah. like yeah hey, whatever so i feel like sometimes like friends and family don't understand that yeah because i know like 
Like, like my housemate, I've lived with her for two years. And when we first started living together was right when I got signed with Monster and started with the UFC. So I was doing a lot of appearances. Like I love doing appearances. But there would be some days where I'd be, you know, I'd have to be on for six hours at a time. Whether I was like doing a two-hour appearance and then having to be with the Monster stuff outside of that. Then doing a stuff dinner and then... I'd come home and I'm like, fuck, I'm exhausted. Like, I don't want to... Train. I don't want to talk. I don't want to be online. Like, I just want to I just want to sit down and play video games and hang out with my dogs. Like, I don't yeah. want to talk to anyone, It becomes you know? super draining. Yeah, it's exhausting. And then it always, like, I go away. You know, I went, I went away for the Anaheim Fitness Expo and I came home and it took me about a day to recover because I was just exhausted from the weekend. Yeah, it's a super brain dump. It yeah. really is. And it, it takes a lot out of you. You know, like... um. I don't know how you guys do it. I mean, to be honest with you, like I have the luxury of kind of dancing between yeah. worlds so I can kind of manage it a little bit better. You guys can as much. I don't but, know how people with kids do it. Oh. I dated a guy a little while ago who had a son and I remember doing an appearance through the day and I came home and that fucking kid, dude, like I was like, you guys got to go home. Like I can't. I need a minute. Yeah, I can't handle it right now. I need a minute. Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough, and it's tough to find a good companion or partner that understands kind of that brain suck and and going through it, and then like you just want to go eat and you just don't want to talk. Yeah, yeah, just let me lay in bed and Something hang out like on that. my phone. Like you just. It's like it's funny, you know. Jay takes a hard line. Like he'll be like, people call me with their problems, and I just hang the phone up. Yeah, like, I can't. <laughs> that's like his line. But like, yeah, I mean, it's hard, and and I applaud all you guys for doing it because I I can say this: everybody I've dealt with that has a legitimate UFC background and has fought in the UFC and and is you know a star, kind yeah. kind of like you, and you know. They're so gracious. They've learned. They've they've kind of really dialed it in. They're super gracious with their time and super caring. And they do a great job kind of managing that relationship with the people. Yeah. And it takes it you takes time. To. Because I know not everybody wants to necessarily do this, but it's important to get your story out there. It's important yeah. to tell, you know, the folks what you got going on. Which leads me to the next thing. Tell me kind of what you got going on next and where people can find you. Uh I'm fighting on UFC Moscow. I wait also question yeah shoot sure. some people say moscow some people say moscow and so i switch it almost every time i say it say moscow or moscow i don't know i'm not from there say it yeah <laughs> I don't, I don't know we have that. a russian we have a russian we can ask him we have a russian Someone here give me we a make ak-47 ask him a question. he's always asking us questions <laughs> i know ask him the question yeah we'll ask we'll actually ask him that um uh, but yeah i'm fighting on ufc moscow or moscow november 9 november 9 and against I'm, two Paddy Kynes at. So I actually fought her back in 2015 at Invicta and I lost decision to her. So I'm very, very excited for this one. So how does it go this time? Well, I win, obviously. What um, round? Uh, you know what? She's really tough. You oh, know? God. Here's the political answer. No, she's really tough. Like, I've already fought her before. You know, I know, I know exactly what she's like. I like to brawl a bit. Like, obviously, going back up to 35, I think I have a lot more power at 35 now. I would like to get... A nice knockout eventually. Maybe this one. Maybe the next one. I'm doing a lot of striking, uh, but I don't know. I don't really like to make predictions because then I feel like I put it in my I put it in my head too much, and then sometimes if you're thinking about something so much and it doesn't happen, it can throw you off. So I know she's gonna be. I know she's gonna be tough. I know she's a lot bigger than me, so she's gonna be heavy. That's it. <laughs> Moscow. Yeah. Cute. It's gonna be like Rocky. <laughs> Jesse's gonna be in the barn training <laughs> right right with the fire the with the fire pit the, the obnoxious <laughs> fire <laughs> pit the brimstone and, and you know uh who else is on that card uh zabit and calvin Qatar. i know that because i'm excited for that one okay uh and then i think it's headlined by jds and anyone else vulcan vulcan Called whatever his name is the giant the really really tall mm -hmm. russian yeah i know who you mean. i have no idea who else is on that card oh yeah. vince pichel i know he's on it i don't know who else and then we have uh there's one then coming up guy. there's one coming up right here in vegas too there's, there's matt and ben's yeah. fight that's yeah. they're kind of headlining that aren't they they're like close to the top of the card aren't no, they? there's three title fights on that card there's three title fights yeah on that card? i don't see that's how much i pay attention yeah so i know there's the 135 title uh amanda and Jermaine Durandame, and then there's Max Holloway and uh, Alex Volkanovsky, and then 
I just saw, well, I saw yesterday that they're talking about finalizing Kamara and Colby. Colby. I don't know if that'll happen. I don't know either. I really want it to. I mean, I'd I, love for I, it to happen really in Vegas. Cause I'll, yeah, because that'll be a great card and yeah. it's local to me <clears throat> and it's easy and I'm friends with freaking three or four people on that card. I just want to see that fight. That's it. I just want to see that I want it here for selfish reasons. To avoid <laughs> a flight. But I'm super pumped for what you have going on. I think this is going to be uh, an awesome wild ride for you the next couple of years. I think the pieces are falling in place, and I think if you just keep up the grind, I think you're going to get all you want. Whether or not you'll win and whether or not you'll lose is going to be up to you. That's true. Yeah. But good things come out of either, so exactly. it's fine. And you have the right attitude. So I'm super pumped. Um, tell everybody where they can find you, because I know Q's pulling up the IG and all that. What are the It's Miss Jesse Jess on everything. On everything? Everything's exactly And why the Miss Jesse Jess? Uh, just like it. Well, it used to be Jesse Jess MMA, and then I have an issue with MMA fighters putting MMA or their yeah, weight division so in their name. So then I just switch it to Miss Jesse Jess. So that, yeah, I don't know. I think it sticks out because I think it it it, it kind of opens more avenues because it has nothing to do. with Yeah, fighting, I think you know? I don't get. The, I'm with you 100. Yeah. percent I say it all well, the like, time. They'll say s- Miss Jesse Jess UFC 135 pound MMA. Like I just don't I don't understand the whole MMA BJJ thing. No, when people either. do that, I don't get it. Like, like why I'm is like, that the only thing that defines you? Like is that all you have going on? Yeah. Because that's like that's like the world they live in. I'm like, listen, you need to think bigger. What else? Any websites? You got a website? No. Nah, no. Nah. Just just Instagram and Twitter, Facebook. I have YouTube, but I haven't posted on it for a long time. But, but that's there coming. Are, there are some funny old driving videos of me talking about how scared of ghosts I am. So do, do more go YouTube. back and watch YouTube. Yeah, do more YouTube. And then um, the fight and um, sponsors. Oh, plug your sponsors. Oh, okay. Monster, CBD, MD, Run Everything Labs. All right. I think that's it. Icon Meals. Yeah. All the... We love Icon here. Yeah. If you go to my Instagram, every single post has discount codes in the comments for all Perfect. of them. For all of them. So check out that. Triumph United. My bad. Triumph. Yeah, <laughs> triumph. Um, all right. And we're going to have some Jesse Ray's barbecue. That's your favorite, too. <sighs> I fucking love that place. Yeah. But you got the website up, Q? Jesse Ray's? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you look at this picture right here, that John is, so not, John is not doing them justice. So Best fucking good. barbecue in Vegas. So good. How good is it, Q? I know my barbecue, okay? Let me, uh, let me claim my black Q, man. Q's a bona fide right black man. Bona fide <laughs> black man. Okay. Hold on, let me pull why up. Do bla- why do black people know barbecue? Hey, man. I don't know. What? Maybe oh, there, wait, he's playing. He's playing oh, like no, one wait, of. The, wait, wait, he's oh, playing no, like no. a sexualized video. He's sexualizing this me. Is porn, okay. <laughs> like I watch this at home by myself in the closet. That's oh gross. my god! But that's disgusting. Like, look at this. Is shit. it because barbecue is southern, right? Whoa, that's racist. <laughs> why is that racist? Q, I'm why, very foreign. Why is that racist? Q, Q, why, why do black people know barbecue? Why white folks can't know barbecue? That's a good question. Well, you know, white folks have no soul. So, um, <laughs> you got to put soul in barbecue, man. Why That's is barbecue <laughs> soul food? <laughs> oh, my God. I'm oh. super foreign. Smash, Please, man. I'm not racist. I'm super foreign. <laughs> I don't oh understand. <laughs> We're not racist here either. Uh, Q, Q calls me a honky every day. <laughs> We're not racist. No, I'm kidding. No, we, don't, we don't see color. That's we don't bullshit. see color. When you go, when you, I think when you grow up in locker rooms the way we all have, we actually laugh and joke about that. Yeah. Stuff. You yeah. include it. Like, it's like, Got to. You, you just, you know what I mean? Because we've all been in the locker room, so to speak. So it's like, what the hell do you care? Like, we've all broken bread together. We've all, it's, nobody thinks like that. But the point is, I do want to know. But in media, yeah. yeah but have in me- to be oh, a little yeah. more aware. Of course, politically, it's a whole thing. But, I mean, I, I don't. I just do want to know why black people know barbecue. There's got to be an origin to that. Sure, you could Google it. Interesting. I have to, I have to check that out, man. Because I watched that Pitmasters on TV. Oh yeah, oh, oh, and it's all old timer white folks. Oh god, you're gonna have to figure out how how yeah soul. I'll buy the soul food thing. <laughs> I'll buy that <laughs> because the owner of Jesse Ray's is white. For the record, he knows barbecue, right? Q. He knows it. Best so, in Vegas. All right. <laughs> so we got we got a white we got we, we won here. one. We've won one. We got one. We got one for the white folks. You live here or you visiting Jesse Ray's barbecue. It's so true. good. I wanna give us quick special thanks to before we, we, we cut this loose and go eat to um, Built Drinks, uh, Beyond Your Limit Training Drinks. They're they're super good. They were kind enough to give us a bunch. And I do want to thank Monster, too. I know we have uh, a ton of monsters. I appreciate everyone. I appreciate everybody taking the time. Go visit KVAR. Go visit KVAR.com. Uh, 
go buy some freedom. And I want to thank everyone in the studio. We're going to go eat and enjoy the day. We're out.